Good morning and welcome. I'm James Schillinglaw. And good morning, I'm Alan Fine. Now today we want to introduce you to a new feature on Insider Travel Report, and we're calling it Travel in 10. Every Monday starting today, we'll post a video summary of the news of the week taken from the stories and videos we post on Insider Travel Report. This new program on what we'd like to call ITR TV will provide you with the top 10 stories of the week, give or take a few, as well as our own commentary on them. And we hope we can keep it to roughly about 10 minutes as well because- Good luck uh, on that one, Alan, right? <laughs> I know these days we're working harder than when we were traveling. Our top story this week is on the restart of cruising. Now, this is a story that's been developing over the past couple of weeks, ever since the Centers for Disease Control announced it would extend the no-sale order on cruises sailing out of U.S. ports to September 30th. Now, the major cruise lines have been extending their voluntary restart dates for months as they try to figure out when they can safely begin cruising again and when the CDC will end its order. Now, many people had assumed that Cruise Lines International Association and major cruise companies were in active discussions with the CDC to figure out how to restart cruising. But in a story I wrote nearly two weeks ago, it became apparent that no such discussions have taken place over the next past few months. And only now, with the CDC's newest extension of the no-sale order, does CLIA Chairman Adam Goldstein feel CLIA has an opportunity to enter into discussions with the CDC. In fact, we're not exactly sure whether those talks have actually begun yet. Now, what is apparent, however, is that there may be a certain bias against cruising within the CDC, at least if an interview of a CDC official in SCIFT is any indication. I wrote about that in my column last Monday, uh, reacting to that interview, and also highlighting a column written by Zane Kirby, asked as president and CEO, titled, Why the Demonization of Cruising Must Stop. Now, we reprinted that column in full the week before last, and last week we interviewed Kirby on Insider Video about why he wrote the column and why he feels the government, uh, you know, in the form of the CDC at least, is not giving the cruise industry a fair shake. And so let's take a look at part of that interview. Well, first off, we have we had petitioned the CDC and the administration for, for answers on how people can cruise safely, or at least more eyesight or, or, or more sight into the process of what they were what they're doing what they're determining with the cruise lines like are there milestones that you've met we 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 we've laid out our case to the cdc and to the administration you know several months ago and got kind of a perfunctory we're working on a response from them which which was very unsatisfying then you know earlier in in the week uh we we saw that advertisement from the cdc that again reminded people that that uh, they shouldn't cruise, and then we saw we, and then there was an, an article uh, that, that came out from someone on the inside who was working, with, who is working for the CDC, and, and it really did it demonized the, the the cruise industry at large and tried to tried to you know uh, uh, I guess uh, say that it was irresponsible of them for to, to try to uh, to try to sell continue selling uh, cruises that they hoped to hoped would uh, materialize and that they'd be able to, be able to sail this fall and, and, and the next next winter. So uh, those those things all combined, the lack of moment, sorry, the lack of response from the CDC itself, um, them taking out full page advertisements, telling people not to cruise, and then and then finally, you know, just having a really what I thought was an inappropriate response from a CDC official uh, in the media about how bad cruise lines are for trying to sell their product was just a little bit beyond the pale. So those are the those are the impetus for writing the the uh, the article, and I I'm, thank you very much for publishing it and. And uh, yeah, it, it just, it, it hit me in, in, a, in, in kind of a, a, a very visceral way. So I, I felt like I, had, I needed to respond. Now clearly Kirby wants his travel advisor members to get back to selling cruises, which is crucial to their survival. If I can do a little editorializing here, the CDC, major cruise lines, CLIA and ASTA really have to get on the same page here so that we don't face another extension of the no sale order beyond September 30th. The cruise lines have been focusing on developing stringent health and safety protocols both on board and on shore to mitigate the spread of coronavirus. They just need the approval and, of course, guidance from the CDC so they can start sailing again and travel advisors can start selling again. You know, hotels are reopening, airlines are flying, and even some tour tours are operating. But cruising, an important segment for travel advisors, remains in lockdown. The powerful images of guests quarantined in their cabins, 
and being flown home from their cruises that we saw last February are still imprinted in people's memories. We have to counter those images by bringing back cruises that offer a completely safe and enjoyable way to travel. And now we'll get our, to our second big story, which is a lot more positive and a little more cutting edge. Alan, over to you. <laughs> Thanks, James. So last week, Virgin Galactic revealed the interior design of its spaceship designed to carry space tourists high into the skies where they'll be able to see the Earth from space and experience weightlessness. Sir Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic is selling these space journeys, which include training at its spaceport America in New Mexico, all the gear necessary, and of course, the space flight itself. Now, right now, these flights are running at about $250,000 a person. So just think of the commission on that. And I think you get a beverage, although not when you're weightless. <laughs> and so at that price, there are already four to 500 people who have signed up for these flights. Last week, Virgin Galactic revealed the interior design of Spaceship Two, which is launched from a carrier aircraft called White Knight Two. Spaceship Two is the vehicle that will actually carry the guests or space tourists into space, and it's a technological marvel. It features customizable seats that make it easy for guests to handle the G-forces as the spaceship's rockets engage. And then the seats recline out of the way during the weightlessness part of the journey so that the guests can get out of their seats and float around. It also has 17 large windows placed throughout the hull so space tourists can see the beauty of Earth below and the darkness of space beyond. And with all newbie astronauts, it's good to note that the windows and walls are equipped with high-tech padding. The video, which was streamed live on YouTube, showed Beth Moses, chief astronaut instructor for Virgin Galactic, the first person to fly in the spaceship cabin as she tested it as a teacher and engineer. She was able to prove the cabin was ready for human occupancy, studying every facet, including how the cabin moves around the guests when the guest is floating and weightless. So it appears that all systems are go for the first space tourism launch, possibly later this year. Virgin Galactic won't confirm when the first commercial launch will actually take place, but Sir Richard Branson has famously vowed to be on the first flight. James, your turn. And Alan, that's pretty cool. And I, I've been watching the development of that, of Virgin Galactic for many years, and to see they're actually doing it at this point is, is amazing. And uh, it, it's going to be a whole new way to travel and possibly to fly between destinations within the world. So we'll see what happens there. Now, here's a story that has yet to happen, but is crucial to the survival of many small travel agencies and independent contractors. Many agencies and ICs got access to government relief earlier this year when Congress passed the CARES Act, which provided additional un unemployment benefits even for ICs, who were not technically employed by the agencies they are affiliated with. Now, many smaller agencies could pay their full-time advisors through the Paycheck Protection Plan, or PPP, which gave them eight weeks of salary for those employees. And bigger agencies, those with more than 500 employees, could get relief from money earmarked for airlines and so-called airline ticket sellers, those larger travel agencies. All this government relief money, more than two trillion of it, was appropriated by Congress with the idea that the crisis would be over by this summer. Well, guess what? It isn't. And indeed, the virus outbreak may be getting worse around the country right now, especially in the South, Midwest, and West. And over the past few weeks, Congress, specifically the U.S. Senate, has been working on another bill providing more relief money. You may have heard about arguments over whether the additional unemployment benefits beyond the regular benefits provided by the states should be an additional $200 a week or $600 a week, as was in the original bill passed this spring. What you may not have heard about is the new version of the PPP, which is in the works, giving businesses more money to pay employees for another period of time. Additional assistance also may be in the works for larger travel agencies, some of whom actually never even got the help they needed in the original bill. And it all comes to a head this week, just days before our Congress goes into recess. Of course, none of this will happen if travel advisors don't actively lobby for COVID relief. That's why ASTA CEO Zane Kirby is urging his members to travel and travel advisors in general to write their congressmen and let them know how crucial this legislation is to their survival. Now, we are laser focused on this, this effort. Uh, I hope that 
anyone who's watching will uh, go to the ASTA portal, the advocacy portal, whether or not, whether, whether you're an ASTA member or not. Of course, I hope you are. But if you're not, please go to that portal. If you have friends and family, blood relatives, or anyone who can, can go to that portal and contact their local congressman. We make it very easy to do so. Now, ASTA even has a sample letter that its members can use to lobby their congressman. So now is the time you as travel advisors need to act. Let's get these additional funds so we can all survive to sell travel another day. Alan, over to you for the next story. Thanks, James. So there are no ships cruising these days because of the CDC order. Well, guess again. The, a few small ship ocean-going cruise lines are already back in the water and offering some pretty exotic sailings. Penon, the French-owned luxury expedition cruise line, resumed operations in July with eight ships setting sail from Iceland, the Dalmatian coast, the Arctic, France, and French Polynesia. This includes the inaugural seasons for the company's final two explorer vessels, the Bello and the Jacques Cartier. Both Penon and sister line Paul Gauguin, which Penon purchased a year ago, have a fleet of smaller sized ships that can reach remote sites where other vessels are not permitted. The Below will circumnavigate Iceland on a new eight day, seven night itinerary from Reykjavik in her inaugural season. The Champlain began her first cruise on July 31st from Dubrovnik with an eight day sailing along the Dalmatian coastline in Croatia. Penant also resumed its expedition cruises to the Arctic on July 11th with four new itineraries, including its inaugural crossing of the Northeast Passage. Penal returned to its French roots starting July 1st with four new itineraries to rediscover France from the sea. And finally, Paul Gauguin began sailings for local residents of French Polynesia on July 18th and opened to international travelers on July 29th. So it might seem, though, that there are still no sailings of small ships from American ports, right? Well, wrong again. Uh, over the weekend, Uncruise Adventures on August 1st became the only small boat sailing in southeast Alaska this summer. Indeed, Uncruise's Wilderness Adventurer will most likely be the only vessel sailing Alaska for the entire season. Uncruise CEO Dan Blanchard welcomed aboard 37 guests and assured them that the brand's signature components of safety and experiential travel were in place for their departure out of Juneau. Uncruise credits its restart to pivoting quickly as a small business and small boat line, along with its ability to negotiate with government officials. The ship now features additional physical distancing, more daily activity rosters, thorough testing, and extensive health and safety protocols. And there's also an occupancy cap of 66%. Over to you, James. Well, Alan, it's amazing that cruises are back in the water, at least the smaller ones. And uh, you did a good, very good job on pronouncing those, all those French names. And Panon has, keeps naming it ships, things that we can't really pronounce. But Panon, and it's a great line, and well, as is Uncruise, right? Well, we took fr French together in middle school and high school. So well, why are you so surprised? Well, I guess we learned our pronunciation well. Anyway, thanks, Alan, and uh, let's go to our fifth story. Uh, top travel leaders are coming together with common policies to counter the coronavirus crisis. We heard last week from the U.S. Travel Association that 14 CEOs of America's most recognizable travel leader companies sent a letter to President Donald Trump and congressional leaders stating that more and better COVID testing is an indispensable component of pursuing an economic recovery. They're also urging a stepped-up federal role in making effective testing more widely available. The letter stresses that sustained recovery will depend on a comprehensive set of measures to provide relief, protection, and stimulus for U.S. employers. It also says that testing should be incorporated in the next legislative package, specifically the TEST Act that has been introduced in the Senate, and all that could come to a vote this month. This letter also follows a statement by other top hotel leaders who are backing an American Hotel and Lodging Association policy requiring face masks, social distancing in common areas, contactless check-in and check-out, and stringent cleaning of rooms in public areas. Executives from Hyatt, Intercontinental, Lowe's, Marriott, and Radisson all signed on to AHLA's new policy. Then this past Friday, as we were reporting in today's issue of ITR, ASTA CEO Zane Kirby issued a call for the Federal Aviation Administration to mandate the wearing of face masks by both passengers and crew while on board aircraft. In the absence of a reliable, non-invasive, rapid response virus testing, it's clear that when it comes to flying, 
More consumers need the reassurance that those they are in close quarters with will act responsibly, Kirby said. And most airlines have required a mask for all employees and passengers, but their authority to enforce such mask compliance rests with the FAA. Is it high time for the FAA to require the use of masks for all flights? In our view, yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm sitting as you're, as you're telling the story, I'm getting anxious. Yeah, well, I love your cat mask. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have well, to sell those. That's my wife's me. artwork. There you go. Well, let's go to our sixth story now. Moving from cruise to accommodations now, uh, here's a way for you to offer your clients the privacy and independence of staying in a home away from home and to compete with those pesky Airbnbs. Classic Vacation has collaborated with Verbo, the Expedia Group sister company, to add instant book vacation rental inventory to the Classic website. Vacation rentals are now available on classicvacations.com where you can access private home inventory direct from the Verbo database. From condos and villas to cabins and castles, you can find accommodations for your clients seeking all the comforts of home. Properties are available in mainland U.S., Hawaii, Canada, Caribbean, and Mexico. Classic Vacations is currently the only tour operator to offer the Verbo private home inventory, and this is Verbo's first collaboration with a tour operator to bring vacation rentals to travel advisors. And of course, it also helps that both companies are owned by Expedia. It's also a great product for this new age of travel during the coronavirus pandemic. This year, most surveys show that travelers want to stay close but still get away, opting for mountainous rural destinations like the Adirondacks and Catskills in New York or northern Minnesota. In keeping with the demand for last-minute trips and longer stays, Classic Vacations is now allowing next-day vacation rental bookings for up to 28 nights at available properties. Jim? Now, one of the world's top luxury cruise lines is celebrating a birthday, and it's a big one. On Friday, July 24th, Crystal Cruises celebrated its 30th anniversary. And on July 24th, 1990, Crystal Harmony, the line's first ship, sailed from San Francisco to Alaska on her maiden voyage. The ship was full of innovations, including private veranda staterooms, alternative dining venues, and spacious suites in public areas. Crystal Harmony, of course, is no longer in the fleet, having left in 2005, but its virtual twin, Crystal Symphony, remains, along with Crystal Serenity. Genting Hong Kong purchased Crystal in 2015, helping the company expand dramatically into expedition cruising and river cruising. Crystal Yacht Cruises launched in December 2015 with Crystal Esprit. That was followed by Crystal River Cruises in 2016, which now has the youngest fleet on Europe's rivers with four ships. Now, Crystal observed the occasion on July 24th by hosting a special 30th anniversary edition of Friday Nights at the Galaxy, as part of its Crystal at Home, a virtual cruise experience series of digital programming. Now the event brought together elements of the Crystal onboard experience to fans across the globe. Now here's an excerpt from all that entertainment. Over to you, Alan, on for our eighth story. You want to give your clients an exclusive experience that previously was available only to VIPs, movie, and TV stars? The Empire State Building Observatory Experience has reopened and now features an exclusive all-access tour. Countless celebrities have visited the iconic building, beating the crowds and lines by being taken on a private tour. Visitors can now enter like a VIP and get a similar red carpet experience with the physical distancing celebrities normally expect. 
The building's new premium ticket for its all-access tour is an exclusive guided tour for visitors, including many features that are otherwise off-limits to general ticket holders, available only through reservation for up to six people. The tour starts in the celebrity entrance corridor with private access to its green room, featuring its own bathroom and makeup rooms. This is the same green room where the stars get ready for special appearances. Visitors can enjoy complimentary snacks and non-alcoholic beverages, see memorabilia gifted by celebrity visitors, and memorialize their visit with a selfie at the Halo photo booth. A chilled bottle of Verve Clicquot is also available for an additional charge, which is a nice touch. There's also a behind the scenes look at archival construction photos on the concourse level, a visit to the world famous 86th floor open air observatory, as well as the 102nd floor, which offers 360 degree views of Manhattan. The only catch is the price, $500 a person. And no word on whether travel advisors can get commissions on that. So use it as a carrot to bundle it with other cool stuff. Well, Alan, I do hope they can get some commissions on that. It sounds like a great experience. And, you know, I haven't been to the Empire State Building in years, but looks like they're finding new ways. This is the way to go. This is the way to go. Absolutely. Let's, let's go to our, our ninth story here. Uh, and at the risk of making this first edition of Travel in 10 a bit too cruise-oriented, we have one more cruise-focused story. Now, Holland American Line has decided to change the name of its upcoming ship to honor some of the most memorable vessels in its nearly 150 year of history. Now the premium cruise line is changing the name of its new build from Rhinedam to Rotterdam and designating it as the new flagship of the fleet. This seventh ship to bear the historic name Rotterdam will be delivered on July 30th, 2021, which is pushed back slightly from its original delivery date of May, 2021, due obviously to the global health situation. Now, the 6th Rotterdam has just left the Holland American fleet and was sold to an unnamed buyer. Now, when we're at Rotterdam, the new Rotterdam is delivered from Fincantieri's Margara shipyard in Italy. It will spend the summer exploring Northern Europe and the Baltic on round-trip cruises from Amsterdam. Uh, guests and travel advisors with clients who are booked on the ship's premier voyage in May and itineraries through July 30th are being contacted with rebooking options. The first ship for Holland America was the original Rotterdam. The company was headquartered in the city of Robert, Rotterdam for many years, and the name has been a hallmark throughout our history since 1872. So clearly the name is powerful and symbolic, according to Gus Antorcha, who is Holland America Line's new president. Now, indeed, there is a lot of history to the Rotterdam name. Holland America's first ship was called Rotterdam, which sailed its maiden voyage from the Netherlands to New York on October 15th, 1872, and it led to the founding of the company on April 18, 1873. Rotterdam II was built in 1878 for British Ship Owners Co. and was purchased by Holland America in 1886. Now, Rotterdam III came along in 1897 and was with the company until 1906. And now the fourth Rotterdam joined the fleet in 1908 and also served as a troop carrier when World War I ended. Following the war, it made regular cruises from New York to the Mediterranean. So there was cruising back then. Rotterdam 5 set sail in 1959 and began sailing transatlantic crossings with two classes of service. It was later converted to a one-class ship in 1969 and sailed with Holland America for 38 years until 1997. And believe me, I was saw Rotterdam once when I was cruising way back in 1970, so I do remember that ship. It currently serves as a hotel and museum in the city of Rotterdam. Rotterdam 6, the most recent to cruise for Holland America, was introduced in 1997 and has sailed as part of the fleet until it was sold earlier this summer. Alan, I'll give it over to you for our 10th and final story. Woohoo! We're all starved for live entertainment these days, and it's worse in New York with Broadway theaters closed for the past four months. Cruise lines have been featuring Broadway entertainment for years now, but the pandemic and the CDC put an end to that. For those interested in Broadway Disney style, they could enjoy such entertainment on board Disney's cruise line ships. And indeed, Disney was all set to debut Tangled, the musical on Disney Magic, until COVID-19 put a halt to the cruising. Last week, Disney posted the complete show online for all those Disney files who can't get enough. And you can forward the show to your clients 
to get them excited about booking that next Disney cruise, hopefully in 2021, if not before. Let's take a brief look at that production. So there you have it, the first edition of ITR TV's Travel in 10. We'd love to get feedback on this program from you, so please email me at james at insidertravelreport.com. Or email me at alan at insidertravelreport.com. We're going to keep tweaking this show until we finally get it right, which will hopefully be sometime before travel starts again. If you don't have time to watch and you want to listen to these newscasts, they're available as podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn and Alexa, and Podbean, with Pandora and Google Podcasts coming soon. So stay safe, stay healthy, keep washing your hands, and we'll see you next Monday. <laughs>